walk from here. And uh, coincidentally, on the side of the building is inscribed Metals Processing Laboratory, because when the building was built, it was the headquarters of the labs for mechanical engineering and material science and metallurgy, and there was an old metal foundry on the fourth floor. And now it's mostly mechanical engineering. Material science is alive and well and thriving, but in a different building. Uh, and the machine shop where we teach uh, our manufacturing classes is, is right here. Uh, and then down one floor here is where MIT's first 3D printers were built about 30 years ago. Uh, and uh, my point uh, today in framing metal additive manufacturing is, uh, goes without saying, so many leading edge products involve processing of advanced metals, right, from spacecraft to our portable electronic devices and medical implants, but uh, in some ways, right, the processing of metals hasn't changed in thousands of years. We're still casting and pouring uh, material, even though there's been a lot of innovation. And this slide is actually stolen from my colleague, uh, Professor Tassan in material science, who, who works on, on metallurgy and alloy design. So the question is, what might be possible if we can 3D print parts and products out of metal uh, with a very, very high level of control? So if you're not familiar with this uh, uh, technology space, here's a video of uh, now industry standard metal 3D printing technique called laser powder bed fusion. Uh, called that because you have lasers scanning over a, a bed of metal powder one layer at a time and building objects in 3D from the bottom up using digital data, as, as is true with any kind of 3D printing. Uh, and there's not a nozzle as shown in this schematic up here, but same idea, point-wise processing. Uh, and through a process like this, you can build a very uh, complex 3D component from, from just the data and the powder material. Uh, and turns out this is a uh, brake caliber for a very high-end car, so maybe not your m mass market application, and there's a lot of post-processing that has to be done after this, but this is like the key step, the cornerstone of the future metal product supply chain. And maybe something that's more tangible is uh, what companies like uh, GE, General Electric, uh, specifically GE Aviation are doing. So GE Aviation has taken uh, components of many of their uh, jet engines and converted them to 3D printing. Uh, and this is one specific engine project, the T901, that they chose to essentially clean sheet design to take advantage of, of metal 3D printing. And all public information here. Uh, and what they have found is by designing the engine from the bottom up to use metal 3D printing as a primary production process, they can't make every part of the engine, but they take, can take significant like sub-assemblies of the engine that would go on a military helicopter like this and, and, and consolidate large number of parts, lumbers of parts into one. And that's because of the ability to 3D print very complex geometries. Uh, and that is a simplification in the architecture of the product and also a simplification in their supply chain. So you have compound benefits. And that's where one of the, I think, real system level changes is going to happen where 3D printing makes sense to be deployed. Uh, and then uh, overall, in a more academic context, uh, uh, another way to think of metal 3D printing and 3D printing overall is when you're conventionally manufacturing a component, uh, uh, say, by machining, uh, you have to take a block of metal and cut excess material away, uh, the cost of making that component goes up with its complexity, uh, i.e. how complex the shape is from left to right here. But if you're 3D printing it, the cost is invariant with complexity. Or if you're using less material to make that component more complex, the cost can actually go down with complexity. So you have two manufacturing techniques with fundamentally opposite economic trends. And, and once those curves start to cross, things get really interesting, and then they get even more interesting when you can do things like this and re-engineer you know, complex machinery and products from the ground up. So like this is one reason where, in the spirit of this conference being the ILP R&D conference, I think that uh, digital manufacturing, additive manufacturing can change how we think about the relationship of R&D to product development. Right? For instance, on the back end, you know, we, can, we can develop new materials, new metals, hand-in-hand uh, -hand with the manufacturing process and do data science to tailor components and alloys to, to specific uh, uses. And I'll end the talk with an example where we may be able to make an aluminum alloy that's stronger than has been 3D printed before. But because of the digital nature of these technologies, uh, we can also think of like bending the curve. So I put this up as a, as a, as a perpendicular earlier because, you know, maybe from my, from my 
researcher point of view, you, you often think of like there's a long path of research and then you hope to get plugged into the early stages of a new program. But if you can develop digital technologies that accelerate the process, maybe you can bend this curve and be, move faster. Uh, and you know, we could have a whole other conversation about like what industries matter the most for 3D printing in terms of their scale and their economics, but I will uh, claim that it, it matters to every industry uh, at some point on the product life cycle. Whether you're talking about making consumer electronic devices in vast quantities, and maybe you're making parts or maybe you're making tooling, or you're talking about making aircraft where 747, only 5,000 in the history of the program. So think of additive manufacturing, regardless of the specific technical details I'll now dive into, as a platform technology that can be inserted within organizations and reach a critical mass. And then you can think of how do you design new products, how do you prototype and develop products faster, and then how do you re-engineer to some extent your supply chains to be more productive, more agile, uh, cut out risk, and so on and so forth. And the exciting thing combining like the lab with what industry is doing is we're really at that stage where a lot of these interesting conversations can happen. So in the rest of the talk, I'll give you some examples uh, moving, I'm sure, quite quickly uh, of research from my lab that tries to touch on uh, some of the key technical aspects needed to bring metal additive manufacturing forward. Uh, and, you know, I, I might come across like, you know, everything we're doing in the lab is awesome and it's new and exciting and we're excited about it, but it's, it's just to tell you a story of some of the key technical issues that matter and, and, and give a sense of what's necessary to advance the industry in our, in our opinion and, and educate the next generation. So here's a, a video of a commercial metal 3D printing system. Same process as you saw before with the four lasers. This one just has one, and it's scanning real time over a bed of powder and, and printing a cross section of a part layer by layer. And if you don't know this process, uh, 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 you, you can now realize that it's extremely complicated, even though it can work very, very well. So every uh, 100 microns, tenth of a millimeter that that laser moves, uh, uh, it's melting metal locally, creating these sparks, which are a metallic vapor, and imparting, you know, forces and very high temperature gradients that turn powdered metal into uh, a finished part. Uh, and uh, a lot of the research on this process needed to industrialize is around understanding the mechanisms from the smallest scale, where the laser hits the powder, uh, to the microstructure, the solidification of the metal, which is important, right, to, to property uh, control, uh, as well as the global heating effects that determine the component's shape uh, and accuracy over time. Uh, and one way that this technology will advance is by computation. So one of our efforts is actually simulating the first step of the process, which is spreading of powder. Uh, and in collaboration with an amazing group at the Technical University of Munich, uh, uh, we've developed a tool set for simulating spreading of powder in the thin layers that's necessary to do high quality metal uh, AM. Uh, and th there's more on the slide than spreading. What's on the left side is a technique to do experiments and simulations in parallel to calibrate the model so we capture the uh, 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 forces between the individual powder particles accurately, and then we take the parameters that we fit between this simple experiment and simulation, and we put it in a model of the spreading process, and therefore we can digitally create powder layers that we can use in a further model of the technique. And this is a technique called uh, a discrete element modeling using the discrete element method, uh, where uh, uh, a specific advance we've made is, is, a, is a technique to consider the frictional and adhesive forces between the powder particles, and therefore you can put in powders of different size distribution into the model and get accurate results. And in the lab, what we do to calibrate this model is uh, a simple technique of x-ray microscopy. So uh, to know that the model in the computer of spreading the powder is accurate, uh, we uh, take a substrate, we take the powder that we're going to use in the 3D printing process, and we spread the powder into a thin layer. We take a picture of that powder layer using an x-ray camera that we set up, an uh, x-ray source, an x-ray detector. Uh, so, uh, and then we can analyze the data we, we get from this process, and we can determine the packing density of the powder on the substrate in the layer that we would use for 3D printing. And we can extract a relationship between the 
packing fraction of the powder and the thickness of the layer. And you know, this may be a bit unclear, but what I mean here is in order to do successful 3D printing layer by layer, each layer needs to have a consistent uniform layer of powder. Each layer of the part needs to have a consistent uniform layer of powder. So every time you scan the laser, you're scanning the laser over the same thing. And you don't want that layer to be too thin, or you don't want that layer to be too thick, and you want to know the tolerances on the layers, characteristics, its thickness, its density, in order to get accurate results. So using this simple technique, and in combination with simulations, if you follow the legend, we've been able to calibrate a relationship between the density of that powder layer and the normalized thickness of the layer. And this is a number with no units because it's the thickness of the layer divided by the average size of powder particles in the layer. So it's kind of a, a universal relationship that you can use across powders of different sizes. And it basically shows how the packing fraction of that layer depends on this normalized layer thickness. And uh, the answer is you, you want to be about here in terms of your layer packing fraction versus thickness if you want to have a good process outcome. And then what we can do is take these powder layers and we can put them in a special 3D printer that we've built that has a, 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 an infrared camera on the top that lets us watch the 3D printing process in, in real time. Not just with a, you know, a, a, an optical camera like the videos I showed you earlier, but with a thermal camera uh, from which we can process the data and look for uh, anomalies, look for flaws. Uh, and what this shows is by comparing the in-process data from the 3D printer, the, using these precise powder layers that we spread, we can do in-process metrology and correlate the in-process data to defects that we would find if we measure the part after the process. And we use uh, that, that uh, correlation is done uh, to computed tomography data or a 3D scan. So the idea of this research is if you can have the right sensors in process in your 3D printer, you can uh, correct for or detect uh, process parameters that lead to defects without having to do post-process metrology of your part. And this is just showing a very simple demonstration from, from Ryan, uh, a little uh, a small pedestal component uh, where uh, we take a, a, a infrared video as we print layer by layer and scan by scan and then create a volumetric thermal image and by simply correlating the minimum and the maximum uh, in radiance at each uh, pixel, we can get a very good correlation through this mutual alignment technique uh, to the uh, density of the part by computed tomography. So not only do we get a good match, but we can find the hot spots and the cold spots and correlate to the, those to flaws after the process. So here I'm giving you general uh, examples of uh, simulation techniques, calibration techniques, and measurement techniques that can go in this future equipment to be able to produce parts on specification every time. And that's what the industry needs to advance all of these applications from jet engines to medical implants. But now let me pause and go in a completely different direction and tell you about economics, right? because these techniques will only be uh, uh, valuable to the industries that can afford them. Uh, and here I choose a chart from uh, BMW, uh, shown at a 3D printing conference actually uh, two years ago this week, so the last one I went to before COVID, uh, called Form Next. And uh, Max, who had uh, BMW's metal 3D printing uh, project, put this chart up and said, you know, hey, uh, uh, hey, hey industry, you know, we're really interested at, at BMW for using metal 3D printed parts in, in series production, even for high-end vehicles. And if you could drop the cost uh, a lot, our demand would go way up, right? You know, just, just follow this chart and, you know, think of volumes of, you know, 1,000 tons per year of metal 3D print, printed parts. That's a huge, huge volume. So this got us thinking and saying, well, you know, what, what is the cost and how would the cost scale with the development of the technology? So Caitlin, who's a, a graduate student in my group, developed a model uh, that uh, captures uh, the cost of this metal 3D printing technique, laser powder bed fusion, as a function of the fundamental limits of the process. Uh, basically, given a laser of a certain spot size and a layer of a certain thickness and then a speed of scanning, what is the rate at which the process can operate before running into a limit, a physical limit where you generate uh, a lot of defects or where you don't melt the material uh, fully? And that gives us a map like this, which I won't explain further, but it basically a multi-parameter trade space of the factors that limit the rate of the process. And then once when you know, once you know how the rate of the process 
uh, is determined, you can turn that into a cost model if you combine the rate with the cost of machines that are available according to like the number of lasers they have and the laser power and so on. And therefore, you can run through this cost model uh, uh, a particular 3D geometry, and you can predict what is the cost per part. This is a a bracket about the size of, of, of my fist uh, as a function of the production quantity. And you know, ignore the low quantity because this is basically what it would cost you to just put one part in a particular machine uh, versus time and look over here and say, here's the, here's the asymptotic cost per component. So one conclusion is you know, if you use a very small machine that maybe is designed for short runs, uh, and, and lower capital cost, you'll pay more if you want to produce a lot of parts on it. And if you use a larger machine that's more of an industrial machine, the cost will be a lot less. Uh, and the cost drops down pretty fast. So uh, these technologies are economically attractive at their limit for short production runs of only 100 or 1,000 and then upward from there. But the other question we can ask is now look far out into the future and say, well, how would the cost scale if we had arbitrary control over the productivity of the machine. Say I could manipulate the economics of this equipment in dollars, capital cost per watt of laser power. So if you follow the laser industry, you know that over time, right, lasers are used more and more in manufacturing and other industries, and technology and scale mean fewer dollars per watt of laser power you purchase. And so, well, what if, what if the cost of lasers went down from, you know, where it is now in terms of like the dollars per watt of, in the machine, all the way down to a hundred or a thousand fold less? And how would the cost of the 3D printing process go down? So let's follow the blue and black curve here, which is for the more productive industrial machine, and show that where we are now is about a factor of 10 above where the technology can go if the machines get more productive per unit of capital investment. But after that, other things matter more, like the cost of the material or the overall productivity of the production line. So uh, by our analysis, uh, if you're just working on machine productivity, you can drop the cost by a factor of 10 from where the technology is now, go from, say, a few dollars per cubic centimeter of a finished part to less than a dollar per cubic centimeter, but you don't go down near 10 cents. And that's a reflection on, if I just make a high level point, like what, what is the price density? What is the cost of products in different categories? Like right now, it's obvious that metal 3D printing is a breakthrough for the commercial space industry, not only because of you know, supply chain, but also because of cost, right? Because the cost of a spacecraft is say, 10 to $100 per cubic centimeter. Of, 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 you know, the, the engine. Uh, but, you know, to get down to automotive, right, a whole body and white of a car can cost like one to $2,000 if that. It's a long way, if ever, that these technologies are going to printing, be printing large parts of cars. But there's a huge sweet spot of value to be captured in this uh, regime, not only medical devices, spacecraft, precision machine parts, uh, aircraft, and so on, and I think we're just at the early stages. And this, I won't pass it around, but this is BMW's first metal 3D printed part, and another one of the mainstream applications, and one that will, you know, multiply a hundredfold is uh, orthopedic implants, and there's over a million people with 3D printed metal implants walking around after a surgery, and, and the reason is that uh, 3D printing can achieve this three-dimensional textured surface. So. Uh, uh, other work building upon this uh, is actually trying to connect economics to design to ma manufacturing constraints. So how do we build tools that can screen geometries that maybe could have different like engineering functionality as heat exchangers or as mechanical brackets? How do we rapidly estimate the cost of manufacturing them by 3D printing or by other methods? And then how do we constrain the designs we explore based on manufacturability. Because while 3D printing can create a lot of things, it can't create everything, and those manufacturing constraints are important. So uh, Caitlin, who I mentioned earlier, and so in my group are working on tools like that. And like the data science side is also important, incorporating human preferences, like, hey, computer, you don't want to you don't want to make that design, or just scanning large sample spaces, because you have orientations and different manufacturing settings that you want to build up a data library uh, of over time. So the next example I'll show you uh, quickly is 
a different uh, kind of metal 3D printing process that we are working on. And uh, the, the motivating idea is, you know, I told you about one metal 3D printing technique, laser powder bed fusion. There's other metal 3D printing techniques. Uh, there's many 3D printing techniques for plastics. Uh, sometimes I get asked, well, what will be the winner in the end? And my answer is there's no single winner. Uh, manufacturing is a library of processes where different processes are chosen because of their strengths and fit to different economic constraints and different uh, product needs. So, and there's still a need for arguably techniques that can fill gaps in current capabilities. So we set out to think of, you know, well, could we create a metal 3D printing process that uh, maybe was analogous to inkjet printing? You know inkjet printing, whether it's in your home office or printing t-shirts, uh, for instance. And uh, you take liquid ink, you put it in a microfabricated print, and, and very quickly you can print individual drops of ink that become patterns and can even become you know, solid 3D objects uh, in other materials. So how could we do that with metals? Uh, and the answer is, well, for reasons of you know, temperature and so on, maybe you don't want to print molten metal directly or try to inkjet a drop of molten metal, uh, but we thought you could do something different, create uh, a printer that has a nozzle and has an ink that is comprised of microparticles of metal, basically particles of metal powder, the same kind of powder that you would use in the laser process I just described. And our little printer, which is just one, one nozzle in the lab, uh, uh, pulls one particle at a time out of that nozzle using a voltage. And on the way to the substrate, the particle uh, uh, is melted by a laser beam. So no laser like scanning over the substrate here, laser intersecting the particle as it flies. And it, it actually works, uh, even though it's a little, bit, a little bit nuts when we first thought of it. Uh, and here's a video of a 150 micron diameter solder, so low melting metal particle being ejected and printed. And it didn't glow because this is a low melting point metal. Uh, but I, I argue that it melted because it went from being a ball to being a, a, a dot on the substrate. And now I'll show you the same process with a smaller particle, 50 microns diameter, so two thousandths of an inch, and a platinum ruthenium alloy, so something that melts at about 1,500 degrees C. And then here, you'll see the particle melt. I play them both again for you. It goes from being dark to being bright, and then it appears again, uh, and it lands on the substrate. So you know, here, you know, li like a lot of stuff that, that we do in the lab, it just ends up being pretty early stage proof of concept before you want to uh, try to uh, spin it out. Uh, but here you see you can print, you know, individual dots of metal, uh, and, and these are the same material. Uh, the only difference is we increase the laser power, so the hotter drop spreads more and actually melts uh, into the substrate when you print on a metal substrate. Here's a bunch of drops being printed one after the other into a line, uh, and then here's our platinum alloy drops on different substrate materials, glass, inconel, and then the, the same platinum or theme alloy, uh, and there's some interesting like fluid mechanics here uh, as the particle freezes. The ripples you see are actually the freezing of the particle uh, at very, very high frequency. So you know, this process is interesting to us because not that it would you know, print parts of cars or even like big pieces of aircraft or spacecraft, but because it's potentially a very high detail process. So this is a, in a way sort of all just you know, some, some educated speculation, uh, but interesting markets for like a direct metal jetting process with fine drops, fine particles could be, you know, dental products. Uh, and we could apply this, I believe, to ceramics as well as metals. Uh, you know, electronics, not, not printing like computer chips, but printing interconnects. Uh, and fine circuit boards, uh, which is a need of the electronics industry, uh, being able to print objects out of multiple materials. If you can jet, it, you can you know, put different materials together, uh, as well as not involving metals, but I threw this one in there. I think this process of just printing particles but not melting them uh, in flight could be useful for printing uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, where you could have different active ingredients in different particles and perhaps uh, tailor the release. So the last example I'll show you as I watch the clock here is maybe just taking us back to the start uh, where I said, you know, I think we can bend the curve between R&D and product development, apply to a lot of industries, but we can also do interesting things on the, on the back end. Uh, and uh, recently a, a, a postdoc uh, research scientist, Mohara uh, who works with us has 
come up with a technique for, uh, to, to keep it short, uh, using high throughput calculations to come up with alloys, i.e. mixtures of different uh, metallic elements that can not only be compatible with 3D printing, but can also have interesting and perhaps unique mechanical properties. So uh, this, this chart, uh, which, which if you follow with me I can refer to you, uh, is, is, is a showing a method for uh, meeting both of these requirements in a high throughput computational sense. And we've applied this to discover an alloy that is 3D printable, can deal with the high heating and cooling rates of metal 3D printing with lasers, and also has very high strength at very high temperatures as an aluminum alloy. And we developed uh, here at MIT and in collaboration with researchers in Germany at the University of Paderborn a rapid workflow to like test the properties of these alloys through laser melting and 3D printing and have a very encouraging preliminary result that we can print crack-free high strength aluminum using lasers uh, and metal 3D printing and also some mechanical properties that are exciting uh, along these lines. Uh, so this is an indication that we can in fact play in that bottom left corner by using computation to design new materials, design new alloys, and, and reduce them to practice perhaps quickly than would be needed in conventional metallurgy. Uh, and uh, to, to extend what, what uh, Brian Anthony said, we also have a professional course in 3D printing. I teach it every summer, one week, uh, uh, and that'll be happening summer 2022, but we also teach it online. So if you go to additivemanufacturing.mit.edu, we have an online course. Uh, uh, Professor Matusik at the back is also one of the instructors at the course, uh, talks about digital design and topology optimization, and uh, a few thousand people have taken the course over the past couple years, so we've really enjoyed uh, that opportunity to uh, help move the industry and organizations forward, and that's the end. Thanks so much for your attention, and if, if there's time, I'd be happy to take any questions. Please. A, a very wide variety, more than I could mention. Titanium, titanium alloys, okay. you know, uh, a lot, but not all aluminum alloys. Uh, another way to say it is in melt-based metal 3D printing processes, you can print pretty much any alloy that is weldable or castable. Uh, and in solid-state metal 3D printing techniques, those based on binding and sintering, more like conventional powder metallurgy, you can print a, another set of alloys that maybe is not so conducive to melt processing like refractories, for instance. Yep, zinc, zinc. I mean, in zinc casting alloys, you can you can print uh, uh, with with melt-based processes as well. Thank you. Yes. Can you comment on the electrical and mechanical properties of the metal? Yeah, uh, great, great question. Like with the, the lines that I showed from our printing process, the electrical properties are effectively bulk properties, right? Because the material is bulk solid metal, right? If you're, you know, in a material where you really want to optimize the electrical properties, like just like conventional copper alloys, right? The, the purity, the, you know, the fine purity of the metal as printed will matter. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that you can achieve mechanical electrical thermal properties in 3D printed parts the same as you can conventionally. And by designing new alloys, you could perhaps achieve better properties via the, the process condition manipulation locally that is derived from microstructure and composition, for instance. So because of this, um, what you just mentioned, it seems like there is potential for using microelectronic circuit boards or yeah, printing. Yeah, print, printing. You know, it, it, 3D printing. The way I described it is not going to go down to the fine link scales that are used in lithography. But I think there's great opportunity for packaging, for microelectronic packaging, like assembly of of, of uh, you know computer chips and sensors together, stacking, bonding, and so on, as well as for thermal management. So, uh, metal 3D printing in the submillimeter scale to can do a lot of things in cooling high power electronics. Like I'm aware of, you know, some some serious supercomputers that have very sophisticated thermal management systems that are all 3D printed in metal. And and that the supercomputer would not run without that cooling system made by 3D printing. Right. So they, they are like both necessary and only together sufficient for the system to operate. Do you see lithography below submicron lithography? You mean by 3D printing or? Yeah, there are submicron 3D printing techniques 
uh, actually based on more so for polymers than for metals. Uh, so yes, there are applications there. Maybe not to make electronic devices, but to make other kinds of microfluidics or you know uh, light manipulation devices. Definitely, that's possible. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we all set.